Hello, my name is Hindu Agad and today I'll be talking about biochip technology. This is an outline of the presentation. First, I will give a short introduction about biomedical devices, then spend the rest of the presentation talking about three main aspects, which are the INFET, the MEMS, NEMS, the lab on chip. And finally, I will give a short conclusion to the whole presentation. Biomedical devices have been around for decades. Today's biocircuits provide therapy to treat numerous conditions. The major current trends in biomedical electronics are portability, miniaturization, connectivity, humanization, security, and reliability. Probably for the sake of this um, presentation, the most important one is the miniaturization. Since it requires advanced integration technologies like CMOS integrated circuits or heterogeneous integration of CMOS, MEMS, and or flexible technologies. Semiconductor technology is now being used for early detection and therapy of disease. Low power CMOS based system can be designed to replicate biology to provide implantable and portable devices for personalized therapy of conditions such as diabetes. Genomic advances in CMOS-based infect technology, for example, is now allowing implementation of point-of-care diagnostic systems. So, what are the infects? The ion-sensitive field effect transistor, infet, or sometimes referred to as uh, ISFET, is implemented using a standard MOSFET simply by removing the gate metal oxide and exposing the polysilicon to a solution. The result is that the threshold voltage of this device is directly related to the pH of the solution due to the binding of hydrogen ion, which is due to a combination of arising from the site binding of ions on the insulated surface combined with the formation of a double layer capacitance. An infet source and drain are constructed as for a MOSFET. The gate electrode is separated from the channel by a barrier which is sensitive to hydrogen ions and a gap to allow the substrate and the test to come in contact with the sensitive barrier. An infet threshold voltage depends on the pH of the substance. So, as you can see from this figure, as the pH changes over time, the threshold voltage of the infet also changes. So basically, when the ion concentration, such as the H+, in this example, changes, the current through the transistor will change accordingly. Here, the solution is used as the gate electrode. Infets are effectively floating gate devices. They suffer from random trap charges that alter their threshold voltage. To help overcome this, researchers are investigating bidirectional electron tunneling. In order to bring the threshold voltage to a desirable value using this method, two inputs are capacitively coupled to the infet floating gate via match capacitors. They are used to indirectly tunnel opposite currents across their oxide isolation to the infet floating gate in a controlled way. The floating gate charges are programmed using a balanced combination of these two tunneling currents. The figure in the left, as you can see, shows an infet model uh, in CMOS with two inputs coupled to its floating gate, a positive tunneling voltage VT plus coupled with the VSCT plus, and a negative tunneling voltage VT minus which is coupled through the CT minus. They are used for bidirectional indirect tunneling. Because tunneling is carried out between a poly 1 gate that is shorted to the infet floating gate, and the substrate diffusion area, current must be prevented from flowing to other substrate area. Diode isolation and programming protocol are used to make sure this diffusion area is always ha uh, this diffusion area always has a reverse bias junction with the surrounding. Figure in the left shows the model of this arrangement, while the figure in the right is a cross section representation, but it's not to scale. This method provides for threshold voltage programming of the infet in standard CMOS without additional processing steps. It can be used for fast matching of infet arrays. This method is particularly useful for disposable lab on chip applications where devices are used only once and hence reliability is not an issue. The ultimate potential of implementation of infet in CMOS, however, lies in their ability to scale with semiconductor roadmap, according to Moore's law. This will allow having large arrays of multiple infets in one chip. 
Given that NFET are derived from standard MOSFETs, we are now seeing this trend increase the number of sensors per microchip, allowing implementation of NFET microarrays as shown in this figure. More importantly, this scaling has shown particular advantage in the area of DNA sequences, whereby an increasing number of NFET sensors per chip allows for parallel non-optical detection leading to a faster as well as cheaper method of genome assembly. In one of the research papers, an NFET chip was presented with 1.2 million sensors capable of sequencing up to 25 million bases in a two-hour run, which is very impressive. The FinFET process described in class may be used as a basis for development of nanowire-based detector of ions in liquid analyte. The silicon fin that is fixed only at the bottom to buried oxide layer can be considered as a nanowire. Its conductance can be controlled by potential of a surrounding liquid analyte. The final dual nanowire in FET is shown. Parts of the nanowires covered with the dielectric passivation layer are responsible for the serious resistance of the nanowires. These devices have always even number of nanowire channels connected in parallel. Multiplication of the nanowires allows for significant enhancement of the device current efficiency and sensor ability. The developed nanowire in FET devices may be used in sensor application, where a small amount of analyte is required. Moreover, their size is compatible with the biological object scale, so it seems to be promising from biological sample investigation perspective. Chips containing several nanowire infrared devices have been assembled in gold-covered PCB foil. Ultra-compressed bonds and all edges of the chip have been electrically insulated. It exhibits rather low transconductance, which although not well understood yet, does not hinder its use in pH measurement applications. The output signal hysteresis and short time stability remain in a range typical for silicon infet with the nitrate dielectric. Now let's talk about the MEMS. MEMS stands for the Microelectromechanical System. It's an integration of small CMOS chip into a large area substrate. The unique feature of this technique enables the integration of macroscale components such as lead and microfluidics. A key component of the technique is the CMOS chip based self aligned masking. This allows for the fabrication of sockets in wafer that are at most 5 micrometers larger than the chip on each side. The chip and the large area substrate are bonded into a, onto a carrier such that the top surface of the two components are flush. The challenge in fabricating these MEMS lies in the packaging. The technologies now share a similar protocol for the integration of chips. However, none of the proposed technologies offer the best combination of microfluidic integration and post-CMOS packaging of CMOS circuitry. Also, these technologies can suffer from low yield, poor die-to-die -die alignment accuracy, and lack of robustness. So, a new technology has been proposed, which is the versatile chip-specific integration technology known as VCSIT, which is a CMOS, MEMS, and, bi and biocompatible, which offer both robustness and very accurate alignment. The first step of this packaging technique is shown in the figure, which is the chip-specific cavity, where the chip is embedded in edge cavities in a carrier substrate. The second part of the integration process is the bonding, which involves bonding the chip and the holder into a carrier wafer. The carrier provides strong support and robustness of the package chip. Adhesive bonding is chosen for the bonding of the holder and the chip into the carrier. And then after that, we have the gap filling and planarization. In this part of the integration, the top surface of the chip and the holder are planarized in order to have a seamless transition from the chip to the holder. This is crucial for the subsequent process step. Any discontinuity at the chip holder interface will lead to broken metal line and thus to an open circuit. As you can see from this figure, the gap between the chip and the holder is completely filled with the SOG or the spin-on glass. The fourth step of this packaging technique is the spin-on glass packaging. This results in complete gap filling from the backside and the planarization of the bottom surface. 
This SOG film, coated on top and bottom, is found to be strong enough to hold the chip firmly inside the holder wafer during any subsequent process steps. And finally, the final step is the contact pattern. This figure shows the final products of the MEMS. Various biosensing experiments are currently underway utilizing the proposed uh, VCSIT technique. This VCSIT process can be easily extended to integrate multiple arrays. An alternate packaging way is to encapsulate individual dye into the body. The result of this method indicates that post CMOS process flow develops for packaging implantable dyes effectively prevents the diffusion of copper or any other metal through the passivation layer, which was an issue for implant, for implant devices because it activates the foreign body response once implanted into the body. Now we're going to talk about the NEMS. The NEMS stands for Nano Electromechanical System. They range, their range is less than 1 nanometer. But before any MES devices can actually be implemented, reasonable integration of carbon-based products must be created. The focus is currently shifting from experimental work towards practical application and device structure that will implement and profit from the use of carbon nanotubes. At this point in NEMS research, there is a general understanding of the properties of carbon nanotubes and graphene. The next challenge to overcome involves understanding all of the properties of these carbon-based tools and using the properties to make efficient and durable NEMS with low failure rates. From NEMS, the label chip technology is becoming very feasible and doable, where a person can perform most of the laboratory tests in one chip and can be done from home. But some researchers aim to make to take MEMS and the lab on chip technology one step further by introducing the concept of the lab on transistor. In this methodology, laboratory operations are performed individually on a single transistor instead of the entire microchip. To demonstrate this concept, a group has developed a heating technique that allows transistor to act as electrically addressable individual heating units. They have coupled the transistor here with the placement of sub-nanoliter droplets to create individual heated reaction volumes, as you can see from this figure. In conclusion, in this presentation I presented some examples of how CMOS technology is now being applied in healthcare to provide novel solutions for early detection and therapy of disease. With specific examples, for example, the, ENF the NFAT, the MEMS, the NANDS, and the lab on chip, which can be used as application in mobile health, genomic technology, and bio-inspired systems. Looking forward, we are now to expect semiconductors to create a revolution in healthcare in a similar w fashion to the mobile phone industry in the early 90s, providing a new wave of intelligent medical devices wirelessly connected to the Internet cloud providing doctors and patients with continuous real-time information and therapy. But for future perspective, we are also looking into organs on a chip. Like, like we have now computer into a single chip, some researchers are actually trying to come up with an organ on a chip which seeks to replicate the function of a human organ on a computer chip. In Harvard's case, in Harvard University case, they have now created a living lang on a chip, heart on a chip, and most recently a gut on a chip, which is very impressive. Thank you for watching this presentation, and here is the reference I used for this pre presentation. Thank you for watching again, and have a good day.